So thank you all for joining another lecture for Introduction to Computer Graphics. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, as promised, physics-based animation. Right? We talked about animation in general last time, and we said that we we're going to talk about uh, physics-based animation in more detail, and that's what we're going to do today. Um, now, specifically, we're going to talk about mass spring systems, um, because I wanted to talk about physics-based animation in a more specific context, uh, because I think that's going to make it a little bit easier for you guys to sort of understand these concepts. Now, we're going to start with talking about it in more general terms, and then we're going to dive right into mass spring systems. Now, mass spring systems, the reason why I pick mass spring systems is that they're probably the easiest simulation system. They're also very versatile. They're used for all sorts of different things. Uh, so they're, they're, used, they're very they're useful in practice. They're also probably the easiest physics-based animation that you can actually implement. Hopefully that will help you understand uh, these, these concepts of physics-based animation quite well. So let's dive in to physics-based animation. I'm going to start with animation. All right, so let's say that I have this relatively simple animation here. I have this, this ball hanging in the air, and it's going to fall down, all right, and hit this ground floor, and it's going to jump back up. You see, let's, it's uh, going down hits and jumps back up and then falls down again. All right, let's stop here. Um, so this is the animation that I want to produce somehow. So when I generate this animation, the frames that I'm going to get will probably look like something like this. Right? So I have a bunch of frames. I label them with different times, like time 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and, and uh, at different times, uh, my ball is at different heights. Right? It's coming down and then balancing and then going up. Now, Obviously, the position of the ball at any frame is important, and we're going to be computing that. The position of the ball, I'm going to uh, label the position of the ball with um, the vector x, uh, and at every time step, I have a different position. So, I, in parentheses, I'm, I'm showing the, the value at that time, right? So, x, the value at time step 8 is over here, the value at time step 7 is over there. Um, Along with these positions, I'm also going to have to track the velocity of this, this object because that's going to sort of determine where it's going to be in the next time step and that's what we're going to be computing. So we'll also have velocities and those velocities are different. We have different velocities at um, every frame here. All right. And these um, positions and velocities, this, this combined positions and velocities at any given time step is going to form my simulation state. And I'm going to be keeping track of this simulation state at all times. Right? Because this simulation state is what will allow me to compute the next frame and where my object is going to be in the next frame. Right? So let's take a look at this simulation state a little bit a little bit more. So at any time, I have the position and I will also have the velocity at that time. And the, obviously the velocity is the time derivative of the position. And this is a notation that's, that's used in physics sometimes. So it's um, x dot is, that means the time derivative of x. All right, so this means specifically that it's just a shorter way of writing this, this derivative, right? So time derivative of x is the velocity. Um, I am showing you this notation because this notation is going to come up later on when we're talking about other stuff, right? So, but very super simple concept. All right. So, what this simulation is going to do is we're going to be computing every frame. From one frame, we're going to compute the next frame. So, we're going to have multiple steps, and every step with every simulation step, we are given the state at in the beginning of the time step. And we're going to compute the, the states, the positions and velocities at the end of the time step, right? I, I wrote it as like t and t plus one, but it's, it's typical to think about a time step as something that can be varied. So let's uh, replace this, this one with delta t. So delta t is my time step size, and uh, I'm given the state at t, and I'm computing the state at t plus delta t, right? So that's the, that's the idea. That's what I'm going to do. With pretty much any simulation, this is, this is what we do. Any physics-based simulation graphics, this, this is what we do. And uh, for that, you know, we could use all sorts of different simulation systems, 
Uh, what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to talk about today, is a relatively simple simulation system and a very, very common way of uh, thinking about this simulation system. We're going to be using Newtonian physics, so it's going to be relatively simple. right? So, Newton, Newton's first law of motion, what does it say? It says, <laughs> if there is no external force, an object that's moving is going to continue moving, right? An object that, that's stationary is going to be stationary. So basically, if there's no external force, then the velocity of the object does not change. Right? If there's nothing impacting an object, it's, and if it has some speed, this, this is Vt, it's going to continue with that speed. So its speed is not changing within the time step, right? Very, very simple. If there's no external force, velocity is constant. Now, if the velocity is constant, the object is going to be moving with constant velocity, right? If the object is moving with constant velocity, its position is going to change. And its position is going to change exactly like this. So this was the original uh, position at the, at the beginning of the time step. So delta t times velocity, this is constant velocity. So position, I'm adding time step times velocity, I get the position at the end of the time step. Fairly simple, right? And it's all coming from Newton's first law of motion. Now, if we want, but this only happens if there's no external force. Oftentimes, we're going to have external force. Like, for example, gravity is some sort of external force. If we have external force, we need to think about Newton's second law of motion. Now, if there is external force, then the external force will, will apply some acceleration to the object. So it's going to change its velocity. That means it's going to have some acceleration, and that brings us to the very famous formula of F is equal to ma. So the force is equal to the mass of the object times acceleration, right? And we can use this formula, given the force, we can use this formula to compute the acceleration. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And going back to our notation, acceleration is, of course, the change in velocity. That's the time derivative of velocity which is the second derivative of position, right? So this double dot. Um, yeah, it's just, just notation. All right, so if there is external force, we're going to be using this formula to compute acceleration. How are we going to do that? Very, very easy, right? Just uh, divide the, the given force by the mass of the object, and there's our acceleration. If there's acceleration, that means its velocity, the object's velocity, is going to change, right? And the velocity is going to change like so. The velocity at the end of the time step is going to be equal to velocity in the beginning of the time step plus time step size times the acceleration, right? And using, using this, we can also write the, um, the position. Now, the position turns out to be uh, this equation, so it's impacted by its velocity, it's also impacted by the acceleration. So this is, this becomes the equation of position. But this, these equations only hold under one condition, one very important condition, that this external force is constant. If the external force is constant, these are the equations. Now, can you think of a constant external force? For example, for an object with constant mass, <laughs> pretty much all objects, right? For an object with constant mass, a constant external force is going to be gravity, right? Gravity is going to be pulling an object down, and that's going to be a constant force applied to an object. So the, these equations actually hold for an object that's in free fall. Right? This is, these are the exact equations for an object in, in free fall in Newtonian physics. All right, so if the external force is not constant. If the force is not constant, force applied to an object is not constant. If it's varying, then things are going to be a little more difficult. <laughs> now that this this force is not constant, so let me uh, write it like this: like force is varying in time. So I just put the force at a particular time uh, satisfies this equation and I can compute the acceleration at a given time if I know the forces at that time. But the, if the force is changing, then the acceleration is changing. Right? Acceleration is not constant anymore. If the acceleration is not constant, the exact equation 
for the change in force and change in uh, position, so a change in velocity and position, is going to be uh, these integrals, right? If the acceleration is changing, then I need to integrate the acceleration from the beginning of the time step to the end of the time step. And that's going to give me the change in velocity. And then I need to integrate the velocity from the beginning of the time step to the end of the time step. And that's going to give me the change in position. Right? So these are the general equations. They always hold. However, you know, how am I going to compute these integrals? So it all depends on this, this force formulation. right? If this force formulation is something simple, then I can actually compute these integrals and find out find out what these equations are exactly supposed to be. But oftentimes, unfortunately, even with a relatively simple simulation scenario, these, these force formulations, they will be a, a little too complicated for us to be able to solve these equations, solve these integrals easily. Right? So we're not going to worry about that. In most cases, for most simulation scenarios that we're interested in computer graphics, the, this force formulation is going to be way too complicated for us to just uh, go and figure out what this integral is supposed to be. So we're not even going to try to do that. What we are going to do is instead of trying to compute these integrals, we're going to sort of try to estimate the results of these integrals. And the way that we're going to estimate the result of these integrals is we're, we're going to use some, some numerical integration techniques. So we're going to numerically try to estimate what the, the, the result of this, this integral is supposed to be. Right? Numerical integration is the most important thing when it comes to physics-based animation. So let's, let's talk about that. Now, there are a whole bunch of different numerical integration techniques for estimating this integral as accurately as possible uh, and as efficiently as possible too. So this can be very, very expensive to compute. So we're gonna, what we're going to talk about is going to be the easiest one of them all. The, uh, the early integration is known as the, <laughs> the easiest integration technique. And it's very, very simple. You know what I'm going to do? You know that integral that was here at dot, dot, dot? I am going to estimate this integral as um, just a constant. I'm going to assume that it's, uh, you know what? I'm going to assume that this acceleration that I compute at the beginning of the time step does not change. I'm going to assume that the force here is constant. I know it's not constant, but I am going to assume that it is constant. Because if it is constant, then my velocity update becomes this. Right, super simple. Now, I technically, I estimated that integral. Yeah, this is a very simple estimation. It's probably not accurate, not very accurate, and it's not going to be very accurate in a lot of cases. And it's only accurate if this force is constant, and oftentimes it isn't. So, you know, it's going to be some estimation, but it's probably not going to be a very accurate estimation. But it turns out it works. Actually, if this delta t is sufficiently small, this turns out to be an okay estimation. Because if the time step is really, really tiny, the change in acceleration, the change in force becomes very, very tiny as well. So the error you make by estimating that it's constant, it becomes okay in practice. So not necessarily a bad idea. But as I said, this is the simplest integration technique. We could do better, but we're, we're really not going to. <laughs> All right? Euler integration assumes that the force is constant. Now, the Euler integration, when it comes to computing the position, is going to have a different, a different assumption. It's going to assume that now that the velocity is constant. The velocity is obviously not constant. I'm changing the velocity here, but I'm going to assume that it is constant because if it is constant, then this becomes my uh, position update. Very, very simple, right? So now I estimated this integral as, as a constant. And again, you know, this is not a very accurate estimation, but if, if this delta t is sufficiently small, it's going to be okay. It's not going to, it's not going to be too bad. Right? So that's the, that's the idea. Now, this is what we call is explicit Euler integration. Now, this is called explicit Euler integration because 
Here, I can compute the acceleration explicitly using this force. Now, this force at time t is, is something I can actually compute just fine. Now, I, I'm not telling you how to compute it just yet. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into force formulations and, and how to compute different forces. But this is going to be something I can easily compute because I know the state at, and I know the positions and velocities at time t. That's the beginning of the time step. So I can explicitly compute this force. That means I can explicitly compute the acceleration. And using that acceleration, everything is explicit here. And that's why it's called explicit Erlen integration. There is also a different form of Erlen integration. Looks kind of similar, but actually very, very different. Now pay attention to this. Now I'm going to change these t's with, sorry, sorry t's with t plus delta t's. Now, What's happening here is it's very, very similar. As you can see, it's still Erlen integration, but this is what's called implicit Erlen integration because I'm updating, the, I'm updating the position by using the velocity at the end of the time step, not in the beginning of the time step, but at the end of the time step. Right? That's what I'm doing here. And here I'm updating the velocity using the acceleration at the end of the time step. Now, I would like to do this and you may think that, oh, this is as inaccurate as the other one. And, and it's true that it is probably as inaccurate as the other one. But, but in practice, this does something very, very different. This becomes numerically a lot more stable. Uh, so uh, simulations using this sort of formulation, they, they again have numerical error, but that numerical error uh, what, what it does is it sort of slows down the simulation, slows down the animation. The, the system loses energy, which is okay. You know, I have some motion, it just dies down. Oftentimes, I want my animation to sort of taper off and die down anyway. So it, for uh, a lot of graphic simulation, this turns out to be something that I actually want, even though it's, it's still inaccurate. But the explicit early integration the one I showed you earlier here, this explicit Euler integration. Again, this is inaccurate, but this inaccuracy adds energy to the system uh, in practice. And by adding energy to the system, your numerical uh, integration sort of explodes. Um, <laughs> you'll, you'll see examples of that. Just take my word for it for the time being. This is a lot better. But now, here's the, here's the tricky part. To be able to compute the accelerations at the end of the time step, I need to know the forces at the end of the time step. Now, I cannot compute the forces at the end of the time step using the state at the beginning of the time step. I need to use the state at the end of the time step. Now, there is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here. To be able to compute this force, I need to know these. But to be able to compute these, I need to know the force. <laughs> now that's the chicken and egg problem. Uh, so this becomes quite difficult to implement in comparison to explicit earlier integration. Oftentimes this forms an, a series of equations and, and you, we solve that implicit system using some numerical methods so that we can sort of estimate the, the positions and estimate the state as we're estimating the forces together. So this forms a giant uh, implicit system that we saw. Uh, because of that, implementation of this becomes a lot more difficult. So it looks very similar, but implementation-wise, it's a lot more complicated. But there is something sort of in between the two. That's what we call semi-implicit early integration. And this is a very, very popular thing to do. With semi-implicit Euler integration, I am explicitly computing the velocities, but then I'm using the implicit integration formula for positions. And this is very easy to do because, because I can compute the acceleration explicitly using the current state. I compute the forces, I got my acceleration, I got my velocity, and once I have my velocity, I might as well just use that velocity for updating my positions, right? So this is super easy to implement, as easy as explicit earlier. The semi-implicit earlier is as easy as explicit earlier, and it turns out to be um, somewhat more stable than the explicit earlier integration in terms of numerically. So this is oftentimes preferred. The only difference, if you compare it to the explicit earlier integration, is that you know I changed this term, right? This, instead of using 
velocity at the beginning of the time step, I'm going to use the velocity at the end of the time step. Right, so, so this is the uh, explicit or the integration. All right, so I, I think now we're ready to talk about how we compute this force. All right, so let's start with the simplest force, the gravity force. All right? Uh, so the gravity force is going to be a constant force, as long as the mass is constant and the gravitational acceleration is constant. Uh, so Fg, F gravity, is mass times the gravitational acceleration. So gravitational acceleration is sort of constant at any one place on Earth, and mass of an object is oftentimes constant, so this becomes a constant force, right? So this is a vector multiplied by a scalar, so it's typically pointing down towards the Earth, or <laughs> whatever planet you're on. I hope you're on Earth. <laughs> All right, so this is the, the simplest uh, force. Now, the force that we're going to be using for our mass spring simulation is going to have a different formulation. That's going to be a, a spring force, more specifically, linear spring force. Now, this is the formulation of a linear spring force. It looks a, a bit more complicated, but it's not really that complicated. So a spring is something, just like a spring, that's attached to our object, and the other end can be fixed or can be attached to some other object. It doesn't really matter. Let's assume that it's fixed for the time being. Now, the spring force is, can be computed for, for a linear spring, can be computed using this formula. So the spring force over here, so there's going to be this constant factor, the spring coefficient, or stiffness. Uh, I represent it here with K. And that's going to be multiplied by the difference in length. So the spring length minus the rest length of the spring. So the spring is going to have a rest length. And if you, if you change the length of the spring, if you compress it or extend it, it's going to exert some force to try to pull the string back to its rest length. So as you can see here, if the spring length is exactly the rest length, this term over here becomes zero, so that becomes, the, the force becomes zero. And the force direction is going to be along the direction of the spring, right? Whatever the direction is. Now, in, in this formulation, I pick this as the force direction, as the spring direction. Uh, so if I pick this as the spring direction, then there's going to be a minus sign over here. Uh, that basically, it's the, could become the same force. Uh, so um, obviously what happens here is that if I extend the spring, it's going to apply a force pulling the object back such that the spring length will be moving towards the, the rest length. Um, similarly, if I compress the spring, it's going to exert a force in the opposite direction. It's going to try to extend the spring, right? So, you know, this is our, uh, our spring, and if I simulate an object like this, let's say that I don't have any gravity, I have an object like this in space attached to something fixed. If I you know, compress the spring and just let it, let it run, then I, I'm going to get a, some motion like this. Right? The object is going to go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I'm applying some, some force because it's compressed. Uh, and as it's extending, it's, it's getting the force applied in the opposite direction and it's going back because of its velocity, it's sort of overshooting. And, and this never ends. It keeps doing that. Now, if I'm computing this numerical integration accurately, this is what it's supposed to do. Um, and oftentimes, this is not very desirable. Yeah, oftentimes, because that's not what happens in reality. In reality, what happens is that if you have an object like this, if you have a system like this, it's not going to keep going like this forever, right? Eventually, this is going to stop because in reality, we have a lot of other things going on. We don't have perfect systems where everything's isolated and such that the system never loses energy. In reality, it's going to lose energy, right? Um, some of the energy of this motion is going to turn into heat and then other things. And uh, so this, this motion is going to slowly die off. That's what happens in reality. Um, so to be able to get a spring that does that, that doesn't infinitely go, go like this forever, to be able to sort of stop this motion at some point, we're going to apply what we call a damping force. 
A damping force is going to be an, another type of spring force. Uh, and this damping force, it's, its whole point is to slow things down, depend on the velocity of the object. More specifically, the speed with which the length is changing. And this is the formulation for the damping force. L dot here is the time derivative of the length. So this is, it doesn't depend on the rest length. It's just the time derivative of the length, how fast the length is changing. So if the length is changing really fast, it's going to apply a stronger force. If the length is changing slowly, it's going to apply a, a weaker force, right? So that's going to be our damping force formulation. As you can see, it's fairly, fairly simple. Okay. Uh, so we've seen some forces. I think we've seen enough forces. I think we're ready to start talking about our target physical base system that is a uh, mass spring system. Now, before I go into details of mass spring system, I want to show you something that I, I've shown you last time. Remember this video? So here in this, in this animation, this, this cloth and these, these uh, torus models, these donuts, are actually simulating using mass spring systems. Uh, so, you know, you can get all sorts of really interesting animations with mass spring systems. The fluid is not a mass spring system, it's, it's different. And in this case, this, this fracturing wall is a mass spring system too. So you can do all sorts of interesting things with mass spring systems. It's, it's a very versatile simulation model. Uh, we're not going to be generating animations quite like these, but actually what you will be implementing as a part of our last project is something that could be used for simulating stuff like this. It's, they're not very different. The only part that's going to be different is going to be part that you're not going to be implementing. The, the integration part is going to be a little bit different to be able to get uh, simulations like this. But they're, they're actually very, very similar to uh, what you will be implementing. And it's going to be relatively simple, you'll see. So a mass spring system is going to have springs, big surprise. <laughs> and it's going to have point masses. It's important that they are point masses, though I'm, I'm representing them as, as like balls with some size, but uh, physically the, the, the equations that we're going to be forming will be assuming that these don't have any size. These are going to be, these are going to be just points, right? But you know, a point, you can't see a point, so that's why I'm representing them as, as these spheres. So point masses and these springs, that's what makes this, this system really, really uh, simple. And these types of point masses are used a lot in computer graphics for all sorts of simulation systems. Now, in this uh, simulation example I showed you a little bit ago, as I said, the cloth and the, the wall were using mass spring systems and the fluid was not using mass spring system, but it was still using uh, these point masses for the fluid simulation, and we call them particles. In, in general. And you know, there are a whole bunch of different particle-based simulations in computer graphics. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them next time, uh, when I'm going to be presenting different forms of physics, uh, physics-based simulations used in computer graphics. Um, and mass spring systems are just one way of using particles, one way of uh, one particular particle-based simulation system. Uh, so these point masses are particles, and the springs are basically connecting those particles. Uh, so each one of these particles, of course, will have their their states. I'm going to have position and velocity for for both of these particles. And if I know the positions and the velocities for these particles that are connected by a spring, then I can easily actually compute the spring force here, right? Spring force. Let me write down the formulation. The same formulation I showed you a little bit ago. It's, it's this, right? So it's the same formulation, the spring force applied on particle zero here is equal to this, this formulation, where L, the spring length, is just the, the, the length of the vector that the, the difference between these two positions, right? So it's a vector from here to here. It's just I'm looking at its length. Um, L is going to be its length. And this direction vector is going to be, in this case, the vector from here towards this one. So this is going to be my direction vector D. All right? And this is the formula. Now, if I'm applying a force of F0S on, on this particle, you know, 
as you would expect, I'm going to have an equal and opposite force on the other end of the spring. Right? So I'm going to have a force applied to the, uh, this other mass, and that's going to be equal to the opposite of, of, of this force F0. All right? So if you compute F0, uh, S, you can compute F1, S easily. Right? So that's the formulation for the, for, for the spring force. And of course, um, you know, the, direction of the, the direction of the force depends on this comparison between the current length and the rest length. Now in this case, the force is pulling the spring, uh, pulling the particles together. That means the spring was extended. That means this uh, rest length was, was shorter than the, its current length here. If the rest length was, was longer, the spring would be applying forces in the opposite direction. We'll, be, we'll try to extend, extend the spring to bring it closer to its rest length. Right? So this is the formulation for the spring force. And uh, my damping force is going to be you know, fairly similar. Again, the same formulation. It depends on the speed with which the length is changing. And I can compute the speed with which the length is changing with this formula. I compute the difference between the, the velocities, and I do a dot product of that with the spring direction. And the reason why I'm doing this dot product is that because I want to know the change along the spring direction. Right? I want to know the speed difference along this direction. I don't know if there's any speed difference in some other direction. I, I'm just interested in this spring direction because that's going to give me how, how fast the length of the spring is changing. Right? So that's why I have this dot product. Right? So dot product of two vectors is going to give me a scalar and that scalar is going to be in speed. And again, the spring direction is the same direction. Right? Very, very similar to the spring force computation. It's just I just have this dot product here and I'm using the velocities. That's really the only difference here. All right, so that, that's really it. That's the spring mass spring system. So in a mass spring system, I'm typically going to have more than one mass. <laughs> I'm typically going to have a, you know, a bunch of masses connected by a bunch of springs. And these springs can be you know, connected in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and and you know, it's, it's how these springs are connected and how these spring uh, stiffness coefficients are defined, will sort of determine what kind of system that we're simulating. So if you're using some cloth simulation, you're going to be using different kind of spring connections. If you're simulating um, a, a, a brittle object uh, and fracture, you're going to be using different types of springs with different stiffness. Right? But the underlying concept is going to be the same. Right? So since we have a whole bunch of objects here, in a mass spring system, our state is going to contain all of them, right? So if I have n mass particles, that means my, my position state is going to be this vector that contains all of them, and my velocity is going to be this vector that contains all of the velocities of all of my particles. So now I'm going to talk about how one could implement a simulation using mass spring system, right? So a general simulation is going to start with some initialization. So first, we're going to initialize the simulation. So how am I going to initialize the simulation? I'm going to give it, I'm given a, a bunch of particles as positions uh, and velocities. And typically, I'm going to say, you know what? In the beginning of the simulation, there's no motion. All the velocities are zero. And particle positions are exactly what's given to me. That's basically simulation initialization. Initialize the state. Velocities are zero, and the positions are whatever that's given to me. And then, for each time step, I am going to do the simulation step. The simulation step is going to compute the next frame, the positions and velocities in the next, next frame. It's going to compute the next, next state. And then, I'm going to take that next state, I'm either going to display it, or I'm going to just record it on this. So if I'm using a real-time simulation for video games or something, I'm going to be displaying that. Uh, if I'm doing an offline simulation that's going to be used in a video, I'm going to record that state. That's the basic idea. That's what we're going to be doing. So the part that you guys are going to be implementing as a part of our next project is going to be the simulation step part. Right? So we're going to talk about this part in a little more detail in a little bit. Uh, but I want to show you what something like this might look like 
in a JavaScript form. So this is not the exact code that we're going to be using. It's not the code that I'll, I'm, I'm going to give you for the, the upcoming project. But you know, it's just uh, sort of representative of what's going on. Just to keep, just to be a little more specific, I would like to uh, show you this. So I'm going to start by initializing the, the positions, which is whatever that's given to me, calling some function that does that. Let's say that I've implemented something like this, and then my velocities are going to be the same length, of course, and they're going to be zero. I got to fill it with zero. Initially, there's no motion. That's very something typical to do. You don't have to do that this way. You can initialize the simulation differently, but typically we initialize it as like no motion in the beginning of the simulation. And then, you know, I'm recording the first frame, though this is my beginning frame, I'm recording this. Uh, I'm recording the positions because probably I don't need to record the velocities because I need to know where the object is. I don't need to record the velocities. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes my rendering system may need those velocities for motion blur and things like that. But if my system doesn't require that, then I don't have to record it. And then I'm going to compute my time step. My time step is going to be the frames per second that I want to generate in my video or in my live real-time animation. Whatever frames per second that I want, my time step size is going to be one over that in seconds. All right? Uh, and then for each frame that I want to compute, I'm going to call this simulation step, just advance this state by delta t, and then record the next frame. So that's, that's the idea, right? So this is, this is like offline simulation, right? I'm, I'm recording the frame. If I want to get something like real-time live simulation, I, I, could, I could do something like this. For example, I you know, initialize it and display the first frame, and again, compute my time step size. And then I use that time step size and convert it to milliseconds. I use this window that set interval uh, method. So it's calling that function every so many milliseconds. And in that function, I am just advancing the simulation and displaying it, displaying the, the result. Right? So that's, um, that's a very typical way of handling this. So the, the heart of the simulation, obviously, is this simulation step part. So let's take a look at that in a, uh, in a bit more detail. So this is what we talked about, the, about simulation step. I, I've shown you this slide before. So we were given the state at the beginning of the time step. We're going to compute the state at the end of the time step. And when I have n particles, this is going to be what's given as the, the state, and I'm going to be computing the, the next state. With using semi-implicit OLED integration, for example, let's, let's, let's take a look at that. Uh, first, we're going to start with computing the total force on each particle. Now, now this, is, this is important. You need to first know all of the forces, the, the total force applied on each particle. You cannot consider the forces one by one. That's going to be a... All right, I shouldn't say you cannot. It kind of makes things uh, quite a bit more difficult. So what we typically do is we, we first finish computing all the forces, and then we do, we do velocity updates, velocity and position updates. So compute all of the forces. After I'm done with computing all of the forces, uh, acting on all of the particles, then I can use that force uh, to compute the acceleration. Uh, and using the acceleration, I can update the velocity. And using the updated velocity, I can update the position. So this becomes the typical semi-implicit Erlen integration. Right. So, um, you know what, what we typically do in a simulation system is that oftentimes we don't get a state and then return a completely separate, set, separate array of states. We typically get a state when we update the state. Right? We get velocities, we change the velocities. That's what we typically do because I oftentimes don't need the state in the beginning of the time step anymore. I'm done with that, I just need the new time steps, right? So uh, typically what happens here is, instead of, I, I'm just gonna write in a simpler form, basically the, the same thing, I'm updating the velocity, right? So I updated the velocity by the acceleration that I computed, and then I'm updating the position by the velocity that I computed. So this becomes, because the velocity update happens before position update, this becomes semi-implicit OLED integration, right? And if I want to do explicit OLED integration, I need to swap them. So I first do positions before I change the velocities, 
and then I change the velocity, and then I change the velocities. So this becomes explicit Euler, right? So again, this was semi-implicit Euler, very easy to implement, and this uh, this is explicit Euler. So as you can see, implementing semi-implicit Euler is as easy as implementing uh, explicit Euler. So you might as well do that. Now, the questionable part here is that how am I going to compute these forces? That's going to be the important part. Now, we typically start by saying all the forces are zero, right? no forces acting on anything, and then I'm going to add gravity. I apply gravity for each particle. I'm multiplying the gravitational acceleration with the mass of the, the particle. Well, fi in this case is zero, so you could probably omit that. <laughs> and then for for each spring between particles I and J, I'm going to be computing the, the spring force and the damping force. And I'm going to add the spring force and the damping force to both particle I and particle J. Of course, in particle J, I am using the negative, the inverse uh, of this force. Right? That's, that's about it, Joe. This is how we compute forces. And this is the stuff that uh, you will be implementing for the upcoming project. Except that there's one more thing, one more thing that's going to be important. That's going to be collisions. Now, without collisions, it's kind of hard to keep an object in place. If you apply gravity and there are no collisions, the object is going to keep falling. <laughs> so if you want to keep an object in, contained in some space, we need to apply some collisions, right? So the object needs to collide with something so it stays within some uh, within some limits. All right. So the, the concept of collision is relatively simple, but actually it's a very very complicated topic, and there are so many details in here. For example, now what happens with a collision is that I'm thinking about a, a, a particle colliding with some stationary object, like it's, it's falling down and it hits this this object. Right. So the first thing that needs to happen here is collision detection. I need to know when this happens. I need to know when this happens. And then, once I detect collision, I need to know what to do with that collision. I need to know what am I supposed to do once I figured out, oh yeah, there's a collision, but that what? Now that would be collision handling part. Now depending on the, the simulation model that, that you use, this stuff can, both of these, can be relatively complicated. Now that what we're going to be implementing for our upcoming project is going to be relatively simple, but these can be complicated things to implement, right? But you know, once we figure out how to handle collisions, we sort of expect this object that fell on the floor to you know, jump back up, right? So if you implement collision handling properly, it's going to be jumping back up. So if you look at this frame by frame, in the beginning, you know, our object was in this position, and the next time step, it fell fell down a little bit, and fell down a little more, and a little more, and a little more, and finally it hits this, this ground plane. Now, in this case, we were very lucky. We were super lucky. Unreasonably lucky, actually, because what are the chances that the exact time point when this ball hits this plane is exactly at this frame four? Right? You know, the object did not have to be exactly there. It could be just a little below, right? Or it could be just a little above. That would be maybe a bit more difficult. Well, in that case, there would be no collision at this point. And if the object continued, then the collision would happen over here. Actually, the exact time of the collision would be in between these two frames, right? The exact time of the collision would be over here. Now, depending on the type of simulation that you're implementing, it might be vital to find exactly when this object collided with this uh, with the floor. It might be vital to find this exact time in between these frames when this object collided the floor. But sometimes it's not that important. For our implementation, we're going to pick the, an easier route and we're not, we're not going to care when exactly this happens. We're just going to detect it after it happens. So after this object goes through this collision, that collision point, that's going to be the, the, the ground plane, we're going to say, oh, collision happened. The object collided. I, I only know that the collision happened before this time step 
in between these two time steps. Now I'm going to detect that during my time step integration after I computed the new positions. So by my simulation step, I'm going, I'm given this state, and from this state I computed this state, and then I check for collisions. Did a collision happen? If a collision happened, then you know I'm going to handle it. But let's talk about collision detection first. How am I going to figure out that this happened? Well, let's say that this is a plane and it's an axis aligned plane and it's aligned with the z-axis. Right? So it's, uh, its normal direction is the z-axis here. And that this plane over here is at z is equal to z0, some, some value. And the, you know, I've been using x to represent the position of my object here. So xz is going to be the z-coordinate of my object's position. If this test is true, if the z position is you know, less than z0, that means the object sort of went inside this plane. Fairly easy check, right? In this specific case, it's fairly easy. It becomes slightly more difficult when my plane is not axis aligned. It becomes a bit more difficult than that if it's not an infinite plane. But we're not getting into that. We're just looking into a relatively simple case. All right. So in this case, my object actually penetrated inside this, this plane, and it wasn't supposed to do that. So I kind of need to figure out a way to take this object and get it out, right? It's not supposed to be below this plane. Uh, it's not supposed to go through the plane. So my time integration, which did not consider collision, found that the next uh, position at the next time step was supposed to be here, but no, this is not a valid position, so I'm going to move it out. So how am I going to do that? First, I am going to figure out how much the object penetrated this uh, collision wall floor in this case. So the, this h here is the length. This, this length is, of course, the, the z coordinate minus d0, right? And I am going to take this object and let's say that um, my, my collisions are handled such that this object is going to bounce off. It's going to bounce right back up, all right? So it's going to bounce right back up by some amount, let's call it h prime. And h prime is going to be, this, this length is h prime, it's going to be uh, r times h, h is, is this value, and r is my restitution coefficient. Uh, so this sort of models what percentage of the object's energy is lost. So R is, is supposed to be, uh, O is supposed to be less than one, or maybe one is okay. That means it's preserving all of its energy. It just bounce right back up. It almost never happens in reality. So you just multiply by some restitution coefficient that sort of models the amount of energy, the percentage of energy that is lost during this, this collision event. All right, so this is how I can compute the updated position of my object at the end of the time step, the updated position of my particle at the end of the time step. Of course, I'm going to have to modify its velocity too, because the velocity over here was still down, right? It was still moving down. Why wouldn't it? But after it collided with, with this plane, my velocity now is going to be pointing up. Right? And it's going to be the updated velocity, I'm representing it as uh, V prime, is going to be minus restitution coefficient times the original velocity. So it's the minus sign just flips the, the velocity in Z direction, and restitution coefficient sort of determines what percentage of that velocity is, is preserved. All right, so that's the, that's the idea for a very simple collision handling model. Uh, that we're going to be using. Um, as I said, we could do more, more complicated things here, but this is definitely good enough, especially for particle-based simulations. You'll, you'll, you'll see that this is definitely good enough. Uh, are we doing any air resistance or anything like that, or just keep it simple? Yeah, we are going to keep it simple. Air resistance, um, it's a more proper term for those, uh, will be uh, drag and lift forces. Properly computing them requires some sort of fluid dynamics, although there are ways to sort of estimate them without fluid dynamics. And oftentimes we, we ignore them because 
for for a lot of cases, they won't matter too much. Sometimes they are very very important. Uh, sometimes they they're not all that important. So we don't we don't always consider that. And in this case, we're we're going to ignore all that additional complexity. All right. So no, there's not going to be any air in, in the vacuum. They're going to be in the vacuum. There's going to be no air or anything impacting the motion of the objects. The other thing that I would like to stress here is that this was an axis aligned plane. Because it's an axis aligned plane, it's only going to change the z component of the velocity. The x and y components of the velocity for, for this collision plane, uh, they're not going to be impacted. Now, if you apply friction, there's got to be friction if you're hitting something, then it's going to change the velocity in the perpendicular direction as well. Oh, another Typical model for handling things like this is instead of you know reflecting the the object position like this and just letting it bounce, oftentimes we treat the restitution coefficient as zero for updating the position. This is called position correction. So we take this and just put it right over here, right over here. I don't you know reflect that and move it all the way up. And just move it right over here where it's barely touching the collision object. That's what we call position correction. Uh, sometimes we don't we don't use position collection. Uh, sometimes we attach a spring between this, this plane and the object. So there are different ways of handling collisions. Uh, this is just one way of handling collisions. I'm thinking this is relatively simple to implement and it's going to be good enough for our for our upcoming project. That's why I'm, I'm talking about this in, in detail. But you know, we have different ways of handling collisions, different ways of detecting collisions for all sorts of different simulations. Now, if I have an infinite plane, it's very easy to detect collision. But if I have a finite plane, it becomes a bit more difficult to detect collision because my object can go through the plane, and because it's a finite plane, I may or may not know if the object went through the plane just by looking at its position. I may need to look at its trajectory. And that's what we call, for example, uh, continuous collision detection. So you'll look at the, the continuous motion from here to there, and that's how we try to find exactly when and where the collision happened. Uh, so the collision detection and handling can be a very, very complicated process. But what we're going to be implementing for our next project is going to be probably the simplest one, the, this one that I just described. All right, so now, uh, this is what I plan to do for today, but if you guys want to see it, I think I could do a sort of live demo of our final project. Would you like to see it? I, I already recorded the video and you, you can watch it, but... All right, let's, let's do a live version and see what happens. Okay, and there's our project, all right. So we're starting with a teapot. Uh, this is a mass spring simulation of a low resolution teapot. Uh, feel free to use a high resolution teapot for, for, for this project. And you're going to see that it's, it's not going to perform so well. <laughs> it's going to be too high resolution probably. All right, let me reset all these values and reset the simulation and start the simulation. So the object is falling down and bouncing off. So we have a wiggly jiggly teapot. And you know you can click any of these vertices, whoop, any of these vertices, and drag it around, and it moves like this. It's bouncing all over the floor, and it's also bouncing all over the the other walls as well. I can make it a bit more stiff. Let's see. Ah, even more stiff. All right. I'll reduce the time step. Just a little bit and increase damping. There you go. All right. So this is what the sort of finished project will look like. Okay. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of parameters here. Let me play with them a little bit. Now, if you increase the mass, uh, let's reset it. If you increase the mass, these spring forces are going to be a little weaker in comparison. So let's let's see this with 
yeah, this is good. Let's see the sort of default settings here is wiggly jiggly. And if I increase the mass, uh, the spring forces are not going to be as strong. So oh, it got inverted. Oh no. <laughs> All right. Reset. So it doesn't impact the amount of gravity, uh, the, the acceleration due to gravity, because you, you multiply by mass and then divide by mass. But sort of it impacts the mass, sort of impacts how the uh, spring forces are uh, impacting the, the, the object. If I reduce the mass too much, it's going to be unstable. It's going to sh it should explode. Oh, there it is. It exploded. Let's reset and oh, it exploded. And it exploded. <laughs> All right. If you don't want it to explode that easily, you can reduce the time step size, and that's going to make things a bit more accurate. Um, so uh, the um, you know the Euler integration, explicit or semi semi implicit Euler integration, is uh, going to be more accurate, more and more accurate. Actually, any kind of type of time integration is going to be more accurate when you reduce the time step size. I can reduce it all the way down to a single mil one millisecond here. Uh, in this case, it you know visually it's slowed down because my computer can't quite keep up with the speed with which it's supposed to s simulate. Uh, if the time step size is one millisecond, that means it needs to recompute a new frame every millisecond, and it cannot quite do that. It takes more than a millisecond in JavaScript to compute this, this simulation. But if I increase it just a little bit, then you know it starts catching up, so it hasn't slowed down anymore. All right, so let's reset this. All right, so there's going to be all these parameters, and you know, you guys should um, play around with it and see what you get. Uh, that's the that's the idea. All right, all right so uh, that's all I have planned for today. We covered everything that you guys need for implementing the lab, final projects. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to hear these, just to see these nice comments. Thank you. Thanks.